So, weaving was an important part of, of life around camp. What I am creating here is a twined bag that would be a large storage bag similar to what you see here. We also have um, this petal woven belt and you can see there are some messages interwoven with the beads and then this is an oblique woven sash. This is a twine bag that looks that would have been um, more of a decorative bag that a man wears and um, you can see that we go from utilitarian to more decorative with the weaving. So if you look around camp and you think about all the different things that actually were woven from the mats to cloth and baskets, you can see how very important different weaving techniques were in our life. So in the process of hunting deer, of course we were producing hides for trade, but also we were utilizing other portions of the deer in addition to the meat we would have eaten. So we would take the deer toes um, and collect those and process them to create ceremonial dance shakers. And these shakers were worn on the legs and they created the rhythm for the stomp dancing for our ceremonies. So there are about 150 deer toes on each legging and they're tied to a piece of leather which is then wrapped around the leg and tied securely so that when we stop dance, we create a nice rhythm and an accompaniment to the men singing. it would be to grind it in a corn grinding stump and then after we ground it we would sift and winnow sift and grind depending on what we wanted to use the corn for so it would produce a, a coarsely ground corn flour that we would mix with other things like beans or pumpkin and cook with We've ground the dried corn in, this, in the grinder or mortar for a while. We would lift the corn out and sift it a winnow so that we can get the more finely ground corn. And then we can throw the corn, the larger pieces, back into the grinder and grind some more. So we're sifting here. And we can see that with the small holes in the basket, the larger pieces are staying in top and the more finely ground corn is staying in, is falling through into the basket for us to save. So once I've sifted, I'm going to take this and put it back in the grinder so and continue to grind and go through that process again.
So we have many um, sources to help us understand how the Creek people would have dressed um, once the deer trade got well underway. We know from those sources that there would have been a combination of things. So you can see that I'm wearing moccasins and leggings that come from the deer skin, but I'm also wearing things that we would have traded for. So we would have traded for cloth or the um, trade shirts and also for our Stroud cloth that the women made wrap skirts with. We know from a quote in a dare that the southeastern women often wore their hair in a bun with ribbons of many colors hanging down. Also, we would have traded for beads, and we could have used the metal from the cooking kettles then to make ornamentation like earrings and um, bracelets. I wanted to talk about to y'all today is what I'm wearing. So I'm not wearing any shoes because I go barefoot all the time and I'm used to it. I mean, it wears out my moccasins, so I don't want to do that. I want to save my moccasins for when it's really, really rocky or the ground has a lot of uh, things that will poke my feet. So starting with my feet, I'm barefoot, saving my moccasins. But if you look above my feet, I have these... Uh, buckskin leggings. And when I say buckskin, what do you call a male deer? Right? A buck. A male deer is a buck. And that's what my leggings are made out of. And uh, there's two separate ones and they're held together by a thread that comes up this way. And uh, so what that's going to do is that's going to protect my legs as I'm going through the brush. Now because I want to look because I want to look uh, good when people see me, I'm going to see the French trader. I have these, these things that we call leg ties. And all these simply are is something to help hold my, uh, my uh, stockings up, my leather stockings, my leggings. <coughs> Nowadays, we would call these garters. Okay, so garters would hold our hose up. In our case, it's a leather, leather stockings. And then I have an English and a French trade shirt. Uh, here where we are in Alabama, it would be French. So this is a trade shirt that's uh, traded for, and it's very nice. It's, it dries out quick, it's made of hemp, and it lasts forever. I've had this shirt for about five years now, and, uh, and it's still going strong. So around my waist, I have a, I have a uh, what's called a tump line. So a tump line is a really, really long thing that you can put across your forehead and you can tie things. So if I'm going to see the French trader or if I'm moving around camp when me and my brother are carrying deer skins, I'll take this tump line off, I'll put it around the deer skins, tie it up, and then I'll put it over my forehead and I'll carry it like that. That way I still have both my hands free and if I need to, I can just drop it off backwards and, and get whatever I'm gonna do. So when, when I have my gun, that we talked about earlier, uh, you have to have to be able to put powder in it. Okay, one of the things that you have to do is you have to have something to carry your powder in. And this right here is actually just a buffalo horn, and uh, it's hollowed out and it carries. This carries about two pounds of powder, which is quite a bit. And then inside my bag here, which is made out of an otter, uh, then I have all the things that I need. I have the balls that go with the gun and I'm able to put the powder in first, then I put uh, some wadding that we use, Spanish moss. Do you know what Spanish moss is? Yeah, most of us do. It's the gray moss that hangs down from the big trees. And then I'll put uh, a lead ball in top of it, and I will pack all that down with my ramrod or my wiping stick, and then I'm ready to go uh, shoot what I'm going to, uh, go hunting and shoot what I'm gonna uh, try and get. Uh, and then around my neck, I, which is interesting, uh, I have these uh, turkey spurs right here because my mother's bird clan. So that means that I'm bird clan. See, in the southeast, we trace our lineage through the mother's family. 
and uh, so it's what we call a matrilineal society. I don't know if y'all ever heard of that, but that means that your mother is who you belong to because she's the one that gave birth to you. So my mother was bird clan, so that means that I am, and so I've got these turkey spurs, and it lets everybody know that I'm a pretty good hunter when it comes down to it because these are some pretty big turkey spurs. And on top of my uh, head, I have uh, all these different things. It's hard for you to see it. We'll probably get some better uh, views of it and everything, but it's finger woven. And you've seen some finger weaving before uh, in, when we were talking, and it's just on a smaller scale. It goes into your hair, and it looks, real, it looks really, really nice. The men, we like to look really good. And uh, now one of the things that you, can, that you can't, we don't know what they are because they've been extinct. And extinct means that something is no longer with us. And up here I have what's called an ivory-billed woodpecker beak. And it's woven into my, into my hair right here. And uh, once again, do you remember what clan I am? Bird clan. So that's a good thing. So now that you know, so when you walk up and you see me, uh, and you don't know who I am, you're going to say, well, I wonder who that guy is. And you're going to notice that I have this because I'm bird clan. You're going to notice that I have this because I'm bird clan. So we have all of these little things that are telling you a little bit about me. So if you're bird clan and you come to my village, where are you going to stay? Who's the relatives? Even though we might not be related by blood, you're going to come stay with me and you're going to eat with me. You're going to have a place to sleep and you're going to be safe because we are what? We're bird clan. So that's a little bit about how I'm dressed and uh, I want to pick my stuff up and get back over here and go hunting. These are the items of which I have for trade. Um, the Indians, they would bring me many different um, hides, and what I wanted the most were these um, deer skins. This is a smoked one. This is of the highest quality, but over here, this bundle here, this is of green hide. These are less valuable, and sometimes they would bring me other skins, such as otter and beaver. We would generally take these as a, as to ensure good relations, but this is what we was most desired. Um, the most prized item for the men would be the gun. This replaced the ancient technology of the bow and the arrow, and every man wanted these. This, this was the difference between life or death and prosperity. Okay, uh, this would be worth 16 pounds of deer skins. 16 pounds of this in exchange for one of these. And this was a this was a average grade gun. But we also had a, a chief's grade gun, being this fine one here. Uh, this would be worth 24 pounds, and this would be bestowed upon a very important man, such as a chief, would be given one of these. Same as with the hatchets or tomahawks. This would be a standard tomahawk, generally referred to by many people as a hatchet. This is of the more common variety, and this is what you would see most people having. This is a, this is a pipe tomahawk, also known as a smoking axe. I, much like the chief's gun, this was often presented to men of high esteem, chiefs and uh, such. We gave gifts like this to ensure peace and good relations. And another example of that would be the, um, would be the armband, the trade silver. Uh, the jewelry was very, very important. And um, the armband was very prized to the men. They fell in love with it and they would wear it on this part of the arm. And sometimes they would have bracelets they would put here. Very, very important. Women love the silk. In fact, they prized it so they even developed a dance for it at the largest um, 
gathering of the year, the Green Corn Festival. The women have their own dance, and it's, it's based around this here. Of course, we have other items as well, such as a shirt. Generally, they prefer to make their own clothing, but sometimes they would prefer some European wearers as well. And this shirt was a very, very popular item. Very prized. Worn by both men and women. Um, the kettle. The kettle was um, a very, very um, useful item, and it was used in a myriad of ways. You could obviously cook with it over a fire, but also there was purposes that you may not be aware of. Sometimes they would chop it up and make it into jewelry or use it and roll it into cones for arrowheads. And it came in a couple different varieties. And these were an item that I would haggle over. They, they would be permitted, permitted to haggle over. This did not have a fixed price. So I have, depending on the market, there was some negotiations there, so this was more on my discretion on what I charge. Another very important item were the knives. I have a couple examples here. This one right here is a, referred to as a boucheron. This is a very high grade French knife, okay? This is a French cooking knife, so this is a lower grade, much more crudely made, but both are very, very important. Not only were these used for war, they were also used for uh, cooking. Indeed, every item you see here had more than one purpose in one way or another. A shirt could be worn by a man or a woman, and when it no longer became wearable, they would rip it up and use it to clean their guns or other banner. Nothing went to waste. The blanket here, this was referred to as a duffel blanket, and this is a very thick wool. And this would be very popular especially in the, in the upper, colder climates, but they, they traded for them here as well. Um, this is what you would use for bedding, and um, that, that was of extreme importance. But in addition to that, we have a second type of wool. We have the, um, we have the straw cloth, this beautiful, be soft um, cloth here, and this is what they would generally make clothing out of such as I'm wearing here. Indeed, it was not just the Indians that wore this, but us French people as well fell in love with it for it is what we could get. Um, there were many different kinds. Um, as you can see here, double stripe, referred to as a list, single list, and the black, which we call a colleton, okay? This was used in many different ways. It's a much thinner wool than the uh, duffel is. But what we could, but often what was done with it was it was worn as what was referred to as a match coat, where they would just take it and wrap it around themselves. Both men and women did this. But additionally, it would be, it would be uh, used for various kinds of clothing. Breech clouts for the men, skirts for the women, and leggings such as I'm wearing here, which would be worn by both men and women, depending on the weather. Um, right here we have an example of that. And this is a, this is a woman's skirt. Made of a uh, made of a red stroud with a uh, white list, but it also has here ring brooches made of silver, and these are what we refer to as silver trade silver, like um, the armbands and the bra like the armbands and the bracelets. These were very very prized, and these were highly decorative items that carried a great weight in social standing also adorned with ribbon and beads. This is a very nice skirt that someone will take someone quite a time to prepare. Beads, again, are very important, worn by both men and women. They come in many different varieties, and many of these, the smaller ones are what we would refer to as common beads. So these were not worth as much. These were used very much so that we would have small, very small ones for weaving and such, and then we would have little larger ones which for wearing. And we even had larger ones still that were more expensive, such as these.
bale right here is how I would procure many of my trade goods. Many of the things would come in this bale here. As you can see, there's an ID here. And this stands for Island Dolphin, or as what many of you would call it today, Dolphin Island in Mobile. And this is where all of the trade goods for this part of New France would come in. They would come here from, from France, travel across the Atlantic, and this is where, and I would, traders such as myself would go down there to procure our goods. And we would fit many things in here, such as cloth, knives, among other things, beads, among other things. Anything we, can use, we could fit in there, we would. And one particular example was this, were the hatchets. They would always be shipped like this. The handles would always be made here. And this was to do two things, to preserve space, and that lumber was more expensive back in France. So here, lumber was cheaper, more accessible, and allow us to get more of these in the same amount of space. And how the transactions would go is the Indians would bring me the bundles of hide, and how I would uh, determine the weight of them was to use this steel you're here. I would, apply, I would attach the hooks, and then I would attach a two pound weight I'm looking for it to level, and when it's level, I know that I have the correct weight. So what is that? Uh, this is uh, this is a steelier. What's the what's the what's oh, the reading? Uh, uh, the, the, the reading is right at 18 pounds. I think. So what is this called? This is called a steelier. This is the the uh, scale. It's a scale. Right. Like to weigh things on, okay. Right, it's a scale to weigh things on. Um, and this is what I would use for the uh, hides. So, so how much are the how much are these hides worth? You, you said 18, so that would be... One gun. That would be like this. I could get this. You could get that. That is 16 pounds. So I would be able to get this and then maybe something else. Something small, yeah. What, if, what about... Um, how many of these could I get for 18? You can get two for they are eight a piece. So I could get two of these, of these, color, uh, yes. these, and I could make a match coat out of this. I like that. Yeah. So two, two of these, uh, this trade wool, or one gun. Yes. Okay, that's a pretty good deal. I've got some more. I've got some more skins. So, but I think for this one right here, I want to get two of these. Two of these. Uh, very good. Very good. Two of these right here. One for me and one for my wife. Very good. Okay. Yes. For, so for that one. Good. Well, I'll go get the. Uh, I'll go get the other bundles of skins. Very good. All right. I'll be back. I'm dressed as a French trader in that would have uh, worked the deerskin trade in the mid 18th century. Um, my dress consists of moccasins, which are made of um, deerskin leather. These are center sole, specific to the Alabama and southeastern regions of the tribes there. These are leggings made up of uh, trade cloth. These are made of straw, specific type, a thin type of wool. They're fastened up to my belt and tied around my ankles, as well as I have a strip, as well as I have my something called a garter, and this is ties around below the knee to help support them. Many different things could be used, but I, I happen to be using strips of excess cloth, for nothing will go to waste here. My pants are knee breeches, and unlike the first time, first half of my body, which is native wear, this is the first piece of European wear. These, this is very common among the Europeans, as well as my shirt. 
They're both made of, of linen, undyed natural linen, as well as I have a gelée, which is a thin wool vest that can be used with or without a additional jacket. My toque, which is made of red yarn, it comes in two different fashions. One that is simply worn as a hat, and there's a one that's a longer tube that's doubled up for colder weather. Dang. I have a bracelet made of brass wire, a common item around these parts, as well as a ring. And in the book JCB, he refers to both French and native warriors carrying three knives, one upon the breast, one in the belt, and one in the garter. I have my gun, which is a French style fusil de chasse. This is a high grade gun and it would have been my prized possession. This is my powder horn for which I put my powder in for my gun, and my shot pouch which I add, which has my ammunition and other things I may need for my gun, tools, flint, etc. Hunting is a learned skill, just like anything else. Today we go to school to learn, to do various tasks. Hunting was a major portion of the life of, of a Creek male. And one of the first tools that um, Creek boys learned to hunt with was a blowgun made of river cane. And that's what I have right here. So I have a piece, a long piece of river cane that when it was growing, this was the part that was in the ground and it was growing up just like this. And so you have to take and cut the gun and then you have to take and you have to heat straighten it. You have to take and put heat on it to be able to go in to take and make the gun straight. Now, the gun has these little sections in here, and of course we cut, we use river cane, um, and so you have to take those out to be able to make a straight tube. So, so one of the ways you can do that is by taking a piece of, a straight piece of hardwood and go in, or even, an, or even another piece of river cane which um, has the end of it, the rides on it, the end of it is really hard. And you take that and you jab it through on the inside. You take and you jab that through. And then you take a, maybe another piece of like a, like a long rod with a piece of flint on the end of it. And you basically make a drill that you go in, in and out. You, you take a drill and you go in and that you go in and out. Okay? So, so the thing is, is that you make, the, you make the tube really, really smooth, okay? So that's the first part. This, that's the gun part. Now we have to make the ammunition. The ammunition, the darts, are really long, and you can see right here I have a blowgun dart. And um, this one's made out of some hard wood. This is actually a bow that broke on me. And so any type of um, wood, any type of hard wood like hickory, or even you can even make a blowgun dart out of the actual cane wall itself, and you can twist them. And, and, and to make them hard that way. The white fluffy stuff that you see on the end right here is called bull thistle. And that's what I have right here. These are, these are bull thistle pods. And they've been collected. And on the inside of them, the, the seeds have this white stuff. And the whole idea is that in the spring when they open up, that the wind catches it and it carries it away. Well, if you collect these before they open up and just before they mature, then you can harvest all this right here and then you can take and you can, you can tie it on to the end of the dart, okay? So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna show you how that we can take this and hopefully shoot the, rat, the, the yellow rabbit that's behind me. So, so I'm gonna take the dart and place it into the tube right here. And I'm gonna take one long deep breath And there we have a dead rabbit.
So, the thing is, is that archery was one of the earliest ways that native people hunted. Before that were spears. So a lot of the points that we find now that people call arrowheads are actually atlatl points. And sometime around the woodland time, then they went to bows. And so the bow that I have here is made out of hickory. It, um, when it was growing, the bark was on this particular side right here. Um, you can see that there's no real no handle to it. In other words, there's just an area that I that that I that I that I, that I you know that I hold, and the string for the bow is actually made out of um, sinew, which is the actual connective fiber for the animal or for, for if, with like or, or bear gut or something like that. Some type some type of um, material or even thin leather can be used for a string. For the ammunition, like the arrow that I just shot right there, that um, these are made out of river cane. River cane is already made round. So the thing is, is that at so so the thing is, is that the only challenge is is to go in and get it straight. Okay. So you can take the cane, you can cut it when it was growing on the from, from the ground. It's actually thicker down here than it is here. And so the thing is, is that you want the weight of the arrow up front. So that actually pull, actually helps out your arrow flight. The um, so you would take and you would cut the um, you would you would go in and you would cut the, the shaft, then you would heat it up. So then the feathers that you see back here, these are made out of turkey wings, and you can see as I hold them up to the camera right here, that you can see how the feathers twist, and what they do is as the arrow leaves the bow that it actually bends itself slightly around the handle here. And so it bends inward, it bends outward, and then, and then it would continue to do that, except for the feathers catch the air and they cause it to start to spin, and that's what gives it accuracy and helps keep it true all the way to the, um, to the target. Then, the points that I have here are made out of kettle brass. These are brass kettle, and they're, they're basically just a piece of cut up, cut up kettle that have been made and cut up to be, be cones. Also, another type of um, point that you see are where they take a brass, they take and go in and cut and make a brass triangle, and it's like an arrowhead. Another type of arrow is this arrow right here. These are um, made for hunting small game. So the arrow here is made real thick on the end, and it's made just like just a just a punch. In other words, it's a bludgeon point. So both of these right here could be used to um, to hunt with. These for small game, these for large game. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and I'm going to go in and finish shooting the remainder of these other arrows. So think about that. So so when I'm shooting, think about the fact that 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 bow. That the, the bow is called that called that arrow as it's coming off is spinning all the way to the target. So as you can see, it's very, very quiet. Hey, I'll tell you what let's do. Let's, uh, let's get this puppet out and show them how we use this puppet with this gun. Absolutely. Let's do that. Yeah, let's do that. Let's go get these arrows. So when we go out hunting, uh, a lot of times we'll hunt with these, these puppets, and it's a little deer head. Uh, 
but the thing I want to talk to you about right now is what we're hunting with. And we're hunting with these guns that we get from the traders. Now what's interesting, if you look at this, uh, it's very long. The barrel on this gun is 46 inches long. And underneath this skin here is what's called a lock. But you might be wondering why there's a squirrel skin on here. This is a fox squirrel that I, that I was able to kill. It's been raining and it's been misting so the moisture gets into the powder. And when the moisture gets into the powder, it doesn't go off. So there's a lot of things about guns that we hear in our, when we're talking to each other, but we don't know that it's about guns. So one of the things is lock, stock, and barrel, right? So this is the lock right here. This is the stock, and this is the barrel. What that means, it is the whole gun. The whole gun is right here. Everything is included. So maybe you've heard that. Then there's another one that we say called going off half cocked. I just pulled the hammer back on this or the cock and when you, it, you can't do anything. You can pull on it, it won't snap, okay? But when you pull it all the way back, then it snaps and the sparks go down into it. The dry powder because I had the squirrel skin on it has kept the powder dry and it jumps through and it goes boom. And I get my deer, I get my squirrel, I get my bear. I love bear meat. Oh my gosh, bear meat is so good. So sometimes there's one more thing called uh, a flash in the pan. So this part right here is called the pan, and that's where you put the powder. And if you shoot it and it just goes like that, it's a flash in the pan, but the gun didn't go off. So you started with a, you wanted a big bang, but it just fizzled out. The Europeans provided, um, both the English and the French provided trade guns. And so this happens to be just an English trade gun. It's a very lightweight gun, it only weighs five and a half pounds. Notice it has a really long barrel. And the thing is, is that people always ask us, well, how accurate are these? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna load for you and I'm gonna shoot and show you how, how the gun goes off. So the first thing I need to do is take and put a charge of black powder real fine black powder and I'll place it in the barrel here. Okay, so now I've got the black powder all the way down the barrel. So now the next thing is to take my wadding and I'm going to use some Spanish moss. I'm going to tear off and just take a wad of it and I'll place it inside the bore. And then I'm going to take my ramrod and I'm going to push that all the way down. Okay, now this is like a single barrel shotgun. So we can either shoot shot out of it or we can shoot a single round ball. So um, let me hold, get one up here and hold it up so you can see it. So there you have, so there's the round ball right there. Okay, so I'm going to take that round ball. I'll put it down the barrel, and then to keep it from rolling out, because to begin with, they're, 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 not, they're not super tight, we're going to take another wad, and we're going to place right here on top of it. And now we're going to pack that down. Okay, so now to make the gun fire, there's a little hole right here. And so what I need to do is I'm gonna have to go in and just take my this piece of bent pick and we have to put powder in what's called the pan right here, the lock. Okay. And now I bump the powder charge away from the thing, and now 
I'm going to go in and I'm going to aim at that orange dot that you can see down on the tree. And as you can see, there's no more orange dot. By the 1750s, pretty much all the southeastern Indian people, especially the Creeks, had become professional market hunters. And of course, deer was the um, primary game that they went after. There were thousands of deer, thousands of deer taken every year in exchange for trade goods as, have, as, been, as we've talked about previously. And one thing that's unique to one of the styles of hunting that they used to procure deer skins was taking these deer dried heads and basically making it into a um, decoy. So earlier on, when the hunters were using bows, you see in earlier paintings by Lemoyne and some of these other, showing them having a deer head on the top of their head and the hide draped over them. And of course, they were having to use both hands for their bows. Well, the thing is, once they had guns, then suddenly, that changes the way that you can hunt. And so the way that we know about this is there was a French officer named Basu who traveled throughout the Southeast. And this is what he says. He says, these people have strange tricks for killing deer. They, they take the dried head of the male of the species, the buck, they take it with them to the woods, they dry it out to where there's nothing putrid. And while they're using it, they make the cry of a deer. And so what is the cry of a deer? It can either be a um, grunt, or it can be sometimes a snort. And all these sounds and these vocalizations are used to call deer in closer. And so once the deer hears what he thinks he wants to hear, and you can also take antlers and bang them together, that then you give him the final piece, which is that he thinks he's seeing a real buck and you can move it to make it look alive. And what you want, and you can also take your gun and cradle it over your arm, and then you can use that to make your shot. So a lot of the things that you see that I have on here are things that are made in, in Europe. So you can see that I'm wearing, even though I'm wearing deer skin moccasins, that the leggings that I have on, they're blue stroud cloth from England. This um, red stroud cloth that from my, from my um, breech clout, this could be made in both England or France. The check shirt that I'm wearing here, this blue check shirt, this is very English. And so um, the steel knife that I have right here is also of English make. And of course the, 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 the gun that I'm carrying here is also English, but a lot of these things you could also get from the French as well. And so the, um, the jewelry that I have on, um, the, ear, the, the silver ear bob, um, you know, it, this is actually a, this is actually an ear bob that's that, that's going through my nose. And then the brass kettles that you get through the trade, this is a piece of brass kettle cut up that's being used for my um, for, for my, my earring. But this could also be used for the points that, that are on the end of arrows. So they were really good at reusing materials and making them in their own way. Also these garters that I have right here, the designs are southeastern, but the materials that are made out of, they're made out of wool yarn, which was come out of trade, basically trade um, um, cloth being unraveled. And then the glass beads were made in Amsterdam and being made and then traded over here. So the thing is, what, what's happening is you're seeing a change in the way that all southeastern people are dressing and, and the, the, the deerskin trade had a huge impact upon that.